Welcome to another episode of Dialogues. My guest today is just uh, an intellectual giant, the philosopher and legal scholar Martha Nussbaum. Martha's work over the last few decades has been extraordinarily broad in its scope. She's originally was known for her work on Greek and Roman philosophy, especially Aristotle, but since then has worked on liberalism, feminism, uh, human rights, forgiveness, justice, the role of the arts, the role of emotions in philosophy, and you know, much, much more. And she also just was just awarded the prestigious Holberg Prize for, for much of that work. She and I talked about her new book, which is called Citadels of Pride, and that looks at the issue of sexual assault and harassment, and in particular, how we should create systems that are about what she calls forward-looking justice rather than backward-looking revenge. And it is, of course, a very timely book. Uh, we dig in on the controversial and topical issue of Title IX, which governs the way that assault is handled on college campuses. We also talk about the limits and the strengths of the Me Too movement, why Division I sports is corrupt in on U.S. colleges, the problems that are caused by the high legal drinking age in the U.S., why public shaming is a really bad idea, and how disappointed she is that many feminists are engaging in that now, and how the sin of pride lies beneath the sexist views that uh, many men have of, of women. Uh, we also talk about Martha's own experience of being assaulted in 1968 by Ralph Waite, uh, who's a famous actor, famous for his role as the father in The Waltons, and her slight guilt at not naming him earlier, and how much progress has been made in the law in particular in the decades since then. We also touch at the end of the conversation on her forthcoming work on animal rights. As always, the links to the many references you make are in the show notes. It's just the kind of conversation I hoped I'd be able to have and am having in this podcast with thinkers of Martha's stature on really important and very topical issues of the day. I hugely enjoyed it myself, and I hope you do too. Martha Nussbaum, thanks for joining me. Richard, I'm delighted to be on the podcast. Well, thanks. It's been a long time since I saw you. You gave a a brilliant speech about John Stuart Mill and liberal feminism uh, back at a Mill conference. I obviously knew your work, but I think that's the first time I actually met you personally. And I've been a, a big fan of your work for, for a long time. So thank you. It's a privilege to have you on and congratulations on, on the new book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yesterday was the yesterday was the book release date. So it's very new. Very new and very exciting. Um, and also it, the book really draws together many, I mean, your books typically do this, but draws together many of the themes, I think, from some of your previous work, obviously, some of your work around feminism, and you've been a long standing you know, supporter of and fighter for women's rights, but also some of your work on justice and anger and forgiveness and so on. And so I actually think that this moment has provided an opportunity for you to draw on a lot of those resources from before, at least that's how I read the book. One thing is, I have been teaching this same this material about sexual harassment and sexual assault for years, but I'd never actually written anything on it. So it gives me an opportunity to do something new based on my teaching and my years of being in a law school. So we obviously won't be able to cover everything in the book, but we'll, we'll, we'll cover as much ground as we can. But I first wanted to get your sense of the moment we're in. You, you say right at the beginning, this is a, obviously a, a radical moment with the Me Too movement and some real, a moment of real reckoning that we're seeing. But you also point out that you've seen wonderful legal progress in many cases. Some of the norms have shifted. We have seen you know, drops in many violent crimes and so on. And so on the one hand, it feels like that. It's the best of times, worst of times in, in some ways. How, how, as an observer of the scene, do you see this moment that we're in, in terms of women's rights? Well, I think I wanted to change the focus a little bit, because the focus has been on the many women who have come forward, often well-known women, with their tales of sexual assault. And I think that's really important, but most often people don't realize what law has been doing for 30 years, 50 years, really. And so I wanted to get law into the picture because I think law is very important. It's not enough to tell your story, but you have to have the right legal structure in order to get a, a conviction. But the other thing is that people tended to think that the Me Too movement began in 2017 when all these Hollywood celebrities came forward. And of course, it began long before. It began at least in the 1970s with many women who are totally unknown 
plaintiffs and their lawyers trying to work to get better laws and to get a wholly different framework for sexual harassment, where there was actually no law about it in, until 1980s. So I wanted to give credit to those many unknown people, quite a few of them actually African-American women who played a part as lawyers and as plaintiffs, and give them some of the credit that they're due and tell their story. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because we now take for granted the idea of a hostile work environment. And and you really, I think you beautifully trace the development of that of that legal uh, that whole area of law, really. And it's interesting because I, I, th- I sometimes find it, there's a problem very often in our psychology, which is how do we hold two thoughts at the same time? One is we've made a lot of progress. There's a lot to celebrate here. And there are many people whose work we need to celebrate. And there's still clearly much more work to do. It sometimes feels in many debates right now that we're unable to hold those two thoughts in our heads at the same time, which is lots done, more to do. Well, I think it's crucial, of course. I mean, it would be amazing if we were ever done with any of the big issues. Um, One of my great heroes is Martin Luther King Jr., as you can see Mm. from the many references in the book. And I, I think he was able to strike that balance rightly all the time by mentioning the the fact that we have come a certain distance and it's a hundred years after the emancipation proclamation but still we haven't gotten the work done and then to chart a direction forward so i wanted to do that too to talk about how far law has come but what are the failings and where where does it need to go and where do we need to go as american men and women but you also say that we need, might need some peace in the gender war, and here's where you draw on Lincoln with malice towards none, charity for all, with firmness in the right. But there are some some feminist thinkers who would say, no, no the last thing we need is peace. You know, we're making some progress now. We actually need more war. And so what led you to feel like the, the call for more peace in the gender war would be helpful? Well, what I do is to call for a just and lasting peace, not just any old peace, but the sort that Lincoln called for, peace with accountability, and with an energetic and ceaseless effort toward fuller justice. So, But peace, meaning that we need to look forward and figure out how we're going to live together. There's no point in just endless recrimination. We also have to move forward. And again, I turn to King as an exemplar of this. He foresaw a future where Black children and white children could join hands as sisters and brothers. And I want to move toward that future. We're not there yet, but I think obviously the special thing about gender injustice is that so often men and women are living together in the same house and the injustice takes place often in the house. So we have to find a way going forward to make that a place of love and peace, peace with justice rather than endless nagging and recrimination. And so I'm against a retributive approach to our problems. I think we need to approach justice with education, with reform, and with very stern deterrence. And I think that's happened a lot in our society. So now in a university, we know what the sexual harassment rules are, or if we don't, we have to undergo a training. Each person every single year has to do sexual harassment training. And that way, you know, people are on notice. And I think actually young men are on notice when they're very young, that this is a a wrong thing to do. And we have to make progress that way, rather than just saying, well, these are bad people, let's push them away, let's ostracize them. No, we're we're really only going to solve the problem if we learn different ways of working together, which means different ways of having sexual relationships, different ways of inhabiting a household, and so forth. Yes, I think this distinction that's come to this, actually, which around the different kinds of approaches you can have, one is the, the retributive approach, and it's about getting retribution, revenge, payback, justice, you've called it in much of your work, as opposed to a justice uh, approach. You have this lovely line where you write, we do have the extremely arduous task of waging a difficult struggle without poisoned weapons. And I read that to me, the task is justice, but the poison is this idea of kind of retribution. And you've written elsewhere that this idea of past injuries having to remain in the past 
and not trying to create repair the original in, injury. So you have this sense of the difference between a forward-looking justice and the kind of angle that leads to that and this retributive justice. Can you unpack that a little bit, particularly in the context of this gender justice moment? Well, more generally, I think a lot of times people naturally feel that if there's been wrong, it must be paid back in kind. I think that's a very natural response to wrongdoing. It's probably an evolutionarily fixed response, a strike back tendency. But, you know, it actually doesn't get you what you want. What you want is to move forward with reparations, with dignity, and payback just doesn't give you that. I'm actually just preparing a class about capital punishment because next week in my opera class, we have the composer Jake Heggie as our guest, and he's going to talk about his great opera, Dead Man Walking, based on Sister Helen's uh, book. And, you know, in that opera, well, in the movie too, I suppose, you see so vividly that these, these parents of the murdered children, they all want to kill the convict. But then what is that going to accomplish? And one of the parents says to Sister Helen, you know, I've been thinking a lot. And I, I actually don't agree with the others. I have been thinking, what, what is this? What is it actually accomplishing? And of course, it, that whole, the whole opera is about that. Mm -hmm. We have horrible wrongdoing, but what are we doing when we think an eye for an eye? We have to kill somebody in order to make it go away, balance it out. What, what are we thinking? It's bad thought, I think. And it never gives you what you want. Mm. It doesn't bring the dead back to life. And it doesn't make the world better. So what going forward, well, of course, with crime, one of the things I like about the British utilitarians is that they saw that you have to think before the crime. What are the social conditions that produce crime? What are the social conditions that have led people to do these things? And if we were a just society, crime would be much less frequent. Then we would still have to deal with it. And we would still have to punish it. But we would do that in the spirit of reform and deterrence, not in the spirit of retribution. So that's basically what I think about gender relations. If we brought up children in a good way and gave them good examples of respectful, egalitarian behavior, then there would be far less of this bad behavior around. Mm. And of course, when we get to the later part of the book, there's still some areas of our na national life in which this bad behavior is insulated by bad structures. And we can talk about that. But, you know, good parents and good schools can do a lot to make it less frequent. And then if it does occur, we need to combat it in the spirit of this is help not helping us get where we want to go. So let's re-educate the person. Let's deter other people from committing the same offense. And let's then move forward and, and try to find a better way to yeah. live together. Yeah, right. Like uh, very Benthamite, as you say, but this idea yeah. of forward looking and so on. And, and that's the kind of this transition anger, which you, you've written about before, but also drawn here as a transitioning to a, a better future rather than sort of pay back eye for an eye for a tooth in terms of kind of yeah. looking back, even though that's a kind of natural thing. Actually, I had Elizabeth Bruning on talking about the return of the death penalty. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and and what that tells us about the the ideas of of criminal justice. But the question then arises as to how the movement currently is playing out. And here, it's, the sort of stereotype answer on the right is Me Too's gone too far, right? And then on the left, it hasn't gone far enough. And I think it's fair it would be fair to say, well, it's hasn't gone far enough in many ways, and it will never have gone far enough until we've r radically changed and made society more just. But you do, I think, agree that there are ways in which we can deploy the kind of public shaming power now in ways that are not going to help bring about justice. You actually have this, it even goes far as to say that there's even a kind of reverse objectification. So you've got objectification as one of the problems that we're fighting against, the objectification of women. But then you have a reverse objectification through this public shaming that's going on uh, of some of the the people who are involved in it. Say, say a bit more about why you think that's a problem, because I think a lot of women will be like, well, you know, the more shame, the better, frankly. And if you if a few people get swept away mm. accidentally in the wash, then, well, you know, you can't make an omelette or whatever metaphor you choose. Well, about 20 years ago, some criminal law thinkers started saying that we should punish people by public shaming. And what they meant was that at the penalty phase, instead of let's say, giving somebody community service or something relatively nice to do, like cleaning up the trash outside my window, we would instead 
punish them by making them look bad in other people's eyes, wearing a license plate saying DWI or something like that. And back then, I thought that was really very bad because, first of all, it's it's un, undignified. It insults the person's dignity. It doesn't just say you did a bad act. Mm-hmm. And I think you always need to separate the act from the person. It says instead, you're a bad type of person. That's who you are, period. And so it, it kind of objectifies you by taking away your your dynamism, your possibilities for change and renewal. But second, it invites the general populace to punish the offender. And I don't think that's what a society should be doing. I think there should be impartial institutions of justice. They're always going to be flawed, but it should be those institutions that punish the offender. And we know in history that when there were witch trials and all these things, it's very unreliable. It's unpopular and ugly people who get targeted. And of course, in history, a lot of them were elderly women. The witches were always Mm. elderly women because they could get away with shaming them. So I think it's a very odd thing for feminists to turn to that history and say, we can use this to our advantage. And I think when you start out and you think you can use it to your advantage, it often gets out of hand and it, it ends up turning against you. If you look at the history of shame punishments, often the type of person that's punished at first is somebody who's done something really bad, but then it spirals and it includes people who are just unpopular. Like the Christian symbol of the fish is actually a penal tattoo that was applied to Christians as a shame punishment. And so of course the Christians seized it and turned it around in their in their own favor. But anyway, shame punishments are not only mob justice, but they're inherently unreliable. And I think we know by now that the internet has, and the social media have made made this all very- I mean, imagine if, yeah, imagine if we'd had Twitter during the Salem witch trials. I mean, it's, yeah, it's- it's... Well, no, I mean, I I just wonder, I just wish, hope that I don't get some terrible false accusation that goes viral, but you know, it's always possible because anything can go viral. And people, if people start not looking for evidence and not giving due process to the accused, I think that's an extremely dangerous place for us to be in. Yeah. So, you know, with the people 20 years ago, at least they had this going for them. There had to be a trial first. The person had to be convicted in a court. And then at the penalty phase, they did the shame punishment. But now we have every trial, district attorney, judge, jury. It's all mob justice. And I think this is just terrible. No doubt a lot of innocent people are being Mm. convicted. I'm not going to give names, but I I do think that there are people who've been hounded out of office who are probably innocent. But in any case, the point is not what, what the probability is. The point is the process has not been gone through. And a society of justice has to be a society under law. And with due process, you want you want the courtroom, not the not the pillory, effectively. Um, yeah, that yeah. should apply. To, that should apply to everybody. Let's go. Let's go back a little bit because we we jumped ahead to that, which I, I wanted to get to. But this the book is about citadels of pride, and you you place heavy conceptual weight on the idea of pride and the problem of pride and how that leads to objectification. You say that pride is key to understanding the prevalence of objectification and that it consists of the vice that of thinking you are above others and that other people are not fully real. And you have this lovely imagery from Dante where you talk about what pride does to us. Can you just say a little bit more about the work that pride is doing for you here and how that leads to this? I am using pride in this very specific sense taken from Dante. There are other different uses of pride. People in the gay rights movement have said to me, look, gay pride is something different. And I agree. Mm. So that's not what I'm talking about. Sure. What I'm talking about is the vice. It's the Christian sin of pride, which is a sin that consists of thinking that you don't have to deal with others because you're the only one in the world, basically. So the proud in Dante's Purgatory are depicted as bent over like hoops so that they can't see the outside world at all. They can only see parts of their own bodies and they deal with people in that way. And, you know, there are a lot of people like that who for whom other people are not fully real. Now, of course, it can be localized. Some people have class pride. 
without having race pride. Some people have race pride without having class pride. But I think it's fair to say that in most societies until very recently, most men have been brought up to have some degree of gender pride. That is thinking that a woman is there for your purposes, not for her own, that her own autonomy does not need to be respected, that her own subjective experience doesn't need to be concerned about. And so this is a kind of pathological narcissism, really. But I think pride is a, is a more natural, less jargony word. And uh, so that's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, there's this idea of not fully real that's in there too. And I loved, I didn't, I, I, think, I guess I knew about the Dante imagery, but this idea of being bent over and uh, looking yeah. in on yourself, it, it contrasts, I think you contrast it with the idea, a very civic Republican idea of being able, of looking someone in the eye. And I was actually very struck by the fact that the last thing that uh, Mummy Till said to Emmett Till before he went to Mississippi to be killed was, don't look the white folks in the eye, Emmett. And there's something about this idea of meeting someone's yeah. gaze of, and it's, it's two way. One is you feel able to look someone in the eye, but also that it's incumbent upon you to look someone in the eye. Yeah. And, and therefore get mutual respect. And they, if you're bent over, as Dante, then, then definitionally you yeah. can't do that. Yeah, I yeah. didn't know that his mother had said that. That's amazing. Do you know Ishmael Reed's amazing novel, Reckless Eyeballing? No. It's about this offense. I mean, because it really was a legally codified offense of looking white people in the eye. But anyway, yes. So yeah. um, you have to be able, you have to be situated in such a way that your gaze is welcomed, invited, and returned. So that's not where we are with race fully. And it's not where we are fully with gender either. But yeah, I think it's already in Dante because he talks about the opposing virtue as one that consists in listening. He doesn't talk about looking so much. He talks about listening, but it's all part of the same picture where the emperor Trajan is the example of the antitype of pride because he listens to a poor woman who comes to him with a grievance. He, she wants him to get justice for her son. And he, he actually listens to this woman's story, treats her as fully real. Of course, I imagine him looking her in the eye and that even though he's the emperor, he is willing to look a very poor woman straight in the eye and give her what she deserves. So there's a moral kind of equality in there, too. And, and I actually like the way you talk about the different kinds of pride and how they're localized. But but also and it, you may say this explicitly or, or at least I read it if it's not there explicitly is that they can overlap in different ways, too. So the idea of patriarchy, which is very often you know, it is men over women can overlap with class, it can overlap with race and so on. So I think a different way to think about patriarchy is one group of men who, for whatever reason, feel like they are above others and others not fully real. So if you're a black man, for example, it's tougher to feel like you're at the top of the apex of this privilege than if you're a white man and, and so on. And so these, these different kinds of pride, they overlap and intersect with each other in ways yeah, that are important. Absolutely. Also, right? And, and this is something black women have known for ages and ages and have articulated that, that we need to join both the movement for racial equality and the women's movement because we suffer from being at the bottom in, in both. So this is what the great African-American lawyer Polly Murray said about the tremendous importance of gender equality for black women in particular. And the first major plaintiff of a Supreme Court sexual harassment case was, in fact, Michelle Vinson, who was a, a black woman who, you know, carried both movements on her, her back, really. And I'm sure one reason her employer felt able to take advantage of her in the terrible way he did was that he, he felt, oh, well, she's not worth anything at all in both race and, and gender terms. So, yeah, I mean, these things intersect. And that's not to say that white women don't have just grievances. Of, of course, I think we do. But black women have been a big part of this movement for gender equality, precisely because they suffer double. Yes, different. Yeah. Overlapping kinds of objectification, again, to use to use your your terminology right? this this like any also, anybody anybody objectifying somebody else for whatever reason is falling guilty of the sin of pride effectively and, and there's also an intersection of class with uh, gender think about the case that i talk about of cheryl araujo the mm. case in new bedford massachusetts which established for the first time in a u.s court that no means no well this was a basically lower class working class woman 
who went to a bar to buy cigarettes and then she was gang raped. But one reason that she had a hard time and they it was only very good lawyering that enabled her to win was that she was a, low, a working class woman. People often think, oh, well, they're open to anything. You can't really rape a lower class woman. And, and so, you know, um, often middle class, upper class women are defended to some extent by their class. But at the same time, we all have vulnerabilities in common. Yes, it's interesting that how many of these cases were really driven by working class women and their and their, and their experience. I want to talk a little bit about experience and, and ask you to reflect a bit on you, your own experience of assault, which you have you have written about mm -hmm. and you've written about in various ways. And I think you've gone further in this book than you have perhaps previously have in talking, but in particular about an experience you had in 1968 when you were assaulted by uh, Ralph Waite, who's well known to many people as the father figure in in the Waltons, and um, so uh, and you you you've written about that, but you didn't name him, and then you did just you have just you know decided to name him relatively recently, and, and so on. You wrote actually in 2018, I myself did not have courage until I think 2015 to name the man, and that was after his death, I believe, and who assaulted me. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that experience has influenced your work, but also this issue of timing and shaming? And just how, how do you think that, if you don't mind talking about it? There was more than one reason why I didn't name him in my original article. It was written right after the Bill Cosby hmm. case came forward. And everyone was saying, oh, this is a horrible thing, Bill Cosby, as though it had never happened to anyone else. No other actor had ever done this. And Bill Cosby, the trusted dad, was the only trusted dad who had ever done this. And I wanted to depersonalize it. I wanted to make it not about Bill Cosby, but to make it something that happens so often to so many women. This was before Harvey Weinstein's accusers came forward and so on. So now, by now we know it does happen to many women all the time. But so if I had named that particular actor at that time, they would have said, oh, well, then there are two individuals who do this. I No, I wanted to say it's something that many people in positions of power feel able to do. Um, before, long ago, when it actually happened, I didn't even think of going to the police, frankly, because 1968, mm -hmm. first of all, it would have been very difficult to have your story believed. But the peculiar thing about my case was that I consented to intercourse, but not to further violence that took place within intercourse. And they totally could not have made that distinction. They would have said, oh, well, you consented, and so you get what you get. So I didn't do that later. When, <clears throat> when he was running for Congress, I did think of coming forward. I thought, how outrageous that he should seek a position of public trust. I knew that he had cleaned up his act. He had stopped drinking, and he had become a born-again Christian. So I didn't think that he was still doing that. So that's one reason against coming forward. But people told me, you know, people will think you're trying to extort money. And of course, that could be said. Many women do make an accusation in order to extort money. I didn't want to get dragged into a mess of that sort. And then you had to also think about the political situation. He was running with, with good principles and good values against a particularly mindless and vapid opponent, that is the widow of Sonny Bono. Mm. So I didn't, I actually thought it would probably be better if he actually won. He did not win, but in any case. So there were various reasons why I didn't come forward then. And then later when I told the story, I didn't name, attach the name mm -hmm. right away because I wanted everyone to see this is a pattern. It's not just you. Were, you were trying to point to the systematic nature of it, rather than yeah. rather than creating, I think, a kind of more. I think you say gossipy approach to, oh, it's him, or it's so you were you wanted to draw attention to the issue rather than the individual. But it, I mean, thank you for talking about it. I think it draws for me. It drew out a few things. One is the importance of ongoing affirmative consent. I think this idea that you know one yes is a permanent yes, and that what you know, just because you're consenting to intercourse doesn't mean anything goes after that. I think it's, yeah, I mean, actually, right. and how far we've come in, I think, recognizing that, uh, that that's the case. But, and and also, hopefully, you would be treated differently now if you came forward than you had been in 68. And so I guess the question to you is, if a young woman came to you, I guess you were 20 or something at the time, and she was 20, and she had a similar experience, what would you advise her to do? Well, 
Well, I think you do have to be ready to mortgage a lot of your life to the legal process if you make a formal charge. Um, my favorite TV show is Law & Order SVU, which I think the very fact that there is an SVU, which is real, I mean, highly trained police officers who specialize in talking to victims, in counseling victims, dealing with their reluctance to come forward, all of this is new in the last oh. uh, 20 years. It makes probably. me so happy, by the way, that you have a favorite TV show, Arthur. It makes me feel so much better. <laughs> well, it, it, it kept but, me off a jury in a sex crime case okay. because, of course, they always ask you what your favorite TV show is. Any law and order case is bad for the defense. They're likely to strike you for cause if you say law right. and order. But this was, okay. this was a he said, she said sex hmm. crime case. So I knew right away when I said that. And, of course, having had the experience of sexual assault was another minus for me as a person on that jury. But um, anyway, yeah, I, I think the police have changed. I think their whole attitude to victims of sex crimes has changed. But still, it's an arduous road to, to go down. There's no doubt. And especially if you've gone past it. Now, the women who are now coming up with long ago stories, now that we some in some states they've gotten rid of the statute of limitations. It's possible for them to do that. Well, for the survivors of child sex abuse, I think it's especially important to come forward because almost always they've suffered greatly psychologically in their ensuing life. But adult women, you know, it's not always the case. I, I frankly don't believe that I suffered in any particular way from that incident. I, I was already firm enough in my own sexual identity, and I was kind of getting firmer in my professional identity, that I, I actually don't feel that I had become a, a, a person who needed the trial in order to go beyond it. I think the main reason to come forward is so that other women will come forward when they want to and be believed. And I do feel guilty mm. that I did not come forward. I mean, earlier, I don't feel guilty because they would have just laughed at me. But later, maybe I should have, even though the statute of limitations would have passed by then. And, um, you know, I think it's the effect on other women. The same is true of sexual harassment, of course. Mm. The, 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 when people come forward, then other people who are incentivized to come forward, they think that they'll be believed and they, they have other examples of people who have been believed. It's a very difficult balance, isn't it? I actually think about a colleague of mine who actually when I was in the British government um, who was I, I assaulted by a very famous actor but who was you know politically connected and having a discussion with her about whether to report it or not. And it was exactly this trade-off. It was, was you know, how much of her time it's going to take and what it's going to mean for her. And she was, she didn't, of course, didn't like it, but it didn't, didn't get to a point where she felt that she'd been particularly damaged by it. And my argument was, yeah, but what if he does it to somebody else? There's almost like a, right. a, a civic responsibility. And so there's a tension between civic responsibility, but also respecting the autonomy of the woman in question to make that judgment call for herself. That's a difficult yeah. thing, right? Is uh, You do end up, I think, arguing for mandatory reporting on college campuses. How does that square with this balance between the autonomy of the woman and the civic responsibility to help others? Well, at first, I think a lot of us objected to the mandatory reporting. So what it involves, just to make yes, it clear, sure. yeah. is that if a student or, um, well, colleague, it wouldn't apply so much. But if a, let's say, undergraduate or graduate student comes to me and says, I've been assaulted, or even more mildly, I've been groped by so-and-so, whether it's a fellow student or a, fellow, or a faculty member, then I, as a so-called mandatory reporter, am obliged to report that to the Title IX office. Now, I guess what I thought at first is they're going to deal with it in a way that doesn't respect the desire of the, uh, the accuser for privacy. And furthermore, it's going to inhibit the confidentiality of our working relationship. With some graduate students, I'm very, you know, I see a lot about them over a course of six years. I hear about their lives, their marriages, their divorces, and, you know, they trust me. Is that going to inhibit that trust? Now, since then, I've actually gotten to think better of it because I see how it operates in practice. And in the case where I was involved, the Title IX office First of all, they're very careful mm. to protect the confidentiality of the accuser. They let them, I have to give the name, 
and then they contact that person. But then she has the full choice. Does she go forward or not? They don't push her. And if she doesn't, they will never divulge her name at all. So in this one case, it was a case of groping, not not of sexual assault. Well, that is a sexual oh, assault, but I mean, yes. that's not a break. Yes. And, um, and, and it was a case where there were two accusers, and they actually decided, consulting with each other, that they would go forward. And it ended up being a very respectful, decent process, where in the end, there was a, an arrangement the, the conviction that was agreed to was a kind of probation for the person who had to undergo mandatory alcohol and sexual harassment counseling and be on, on probation for a year. And then that person was reintegrated, went back on the job market and got a job. Mm. And apparently the behavior did not recur. So you never know, of course, right. and you have to keep an eye on that person. Uh, that's but, a good but process. Now, From your point of view, that's a good process, right? That was the yeah, right. I think it, it is a good process yeah. because it ended up the women felt better that they had done that, definitely. And these were women who were feeling very vulnerable early in their graduate school career, and they they felt much better that they had done that. And they felt that their privacy had been respected and that things had gone in the direction that they wanted it to go. So, you know, different Title IX offices may, may behave better or worse, but I think the basic arrangement is not that bad. Yeah, so you're right. It's part, It's about shifting a norm. You said in a lecture I was listening to earlier something that the law moves, but it normally it normally needs to be goaded into action by ethics. And I so I suppose yeah. this is another example of that. One more a question before I get into one of the citadels of pride, at least, um, which is about the role of forgiveness, which you've written quite a bit about before in, in one of your previous books, Anger and Forgiveness. I actually came across one a case of a reconciliation that as a result of me too and I don't know if you saw this Dan Harmon who's a comedy writer he he writes Rick and Morty but he also wrote for community he was harassing one of his co-writers uh, who worked for him mm -hmm. Megan Gans and he offered this very full apology and in the apology he actually said I wouldn't have been able to do it if I had any respect for women on a fundamental level I was thinking about them as different creatures which is a very Nussbaumian insight, mm. I thought. Yeah. Um, and he offered this follow-up, and she forgave him. And then she said, I think of Dan as a work in progress. That's how I think of myself too. It's dangerous to think of yourself as a hero and someone else as a villain. It gets in the way of empathy. We should be tearing down walls, not putting them up. And so that's a great example. That was the end of 2017. That was an, uh, pr probably the only example <laughs> where someone, a uh, proper apology and some forgiveness. What do you think of the role of potential for forgiveness in these? Because you've been quite critical of certain Judeo-Christian notions of forgiveness yeah. here as doing yeah. doing bad work for us, but it seems like something towards reconciliation would be useful. Can you talk a bit about that here? Well, of course, forgiveness takes many forms, but the classic form that is canonical in Judeo-Christian tradition is where the offender has to Hum humble himself, I'll say him in this case, before the, the victim and beg for forgiveness because it's modeled on attitudes that the believer ought to have to God. So the, the first thing is humility, confession, begging for forgiveness, and then maybe you get it in the end. Well, I, you know, I worry about that because I think it can the demand for that can be a covert form of retributive anger. It can be the demand, oh, you get down there and grovel in the dust, and then maybe I'll forgive you. And I think a lot of marital demands for forgiveness take that form. You know, it's a punishment, really, for the betraying spouse. You grovel enough, and then maybe, maybe I'll forgive you. Mm. Unconditional forgiveness, which, of course, uh, is what I think Jesus on balance is supposed to have favored, is much better. But even that... It, it kind of the question is, should you have it's a waving of angry feelings, but should you have had those angry feelings of a retributive sort in the first place? So that I'm a little skeptical about that. And when St. Paul says, Forgive them, for you will heap coals of fire on their head, then I see, you know, punishment in the wings, and I'm not so happy with that. Um, the what I'm in favor of is a kind of generous love and acceptance. Nelson Mandela hmm. never used the word forgiveness in all of his career. I've read pretty much everything he ever wrote, <clears throat> but he was very in favor 
of going toward his enemies with an open-hearted, generous attitude that expected good in future, that didn't hold the past over their heads, and didn't demand anything except good behavior going forward. I find mm-hmm. this in the story of the prodigal son. I think that's, you know, unconditional love and generosity. So that's basically what I favor. Now, apology can often play a part in that, certainly. It's a, a sign that that person is, you, you can enter into a relationship of generosity and friendship with that person. And I have to say, there, there are cases where wrong has been done, where an apology is really important to establish a relationship going forward. So I didn't get tenure at Harvard in a process where the philosophy department voted for me and the classics department voted against me. And um, there was sex discrimination in that process, no doubt. I was urged to bring a grievance, but people said to me, well, you know, right now they're only saying nasty things about your personality and your appearance. And so if you bring a grievance, then they will have to read your work and say bad things about your work. So you better quit while you're ahead is basically what I was advised. And I didn't want to stay there anyway, Mm. so I didn't bring a grievance. But years later, I got an offer from Harvard, and it involved partly an appointment in the classics department. There were, by that time, only three people who had been there before. And of those, only one I had known to have voted against me. And that one who was a very great scholar, I think a very naive person who had been led by others who were not so well inclined toward me. Uh, But this one had voted against me, but he came up to me and he said, you know, I really want to say, I think injustice was done and I'm very sorry. I thought that was actually very important because this was a great scholar to whom I owed quite a lot. And, And so I actually, he was dying at the time that I gave the Jefferson lecture at the NEH and I dedicated it to his memory because I, I really felt it was worth, you know, in, embracing that and saying, yes, there is a relationship of uh, the kind of love you have for a great, great scholar, not a philosopher, but somebody who did great technical scholarship and who had done something that was, I, I think, wrong and he thought wrong, but he did admit it and, and apologize. So, so I'm not against apology, but I never would have, you know, said to the people, when I was considering the offer, well, you now, if you apologize, so it's more about the, well it, yes, offer. it's more. Of, I think this idea of forward-looking does a lot of work here too. Actually, the Harmon forget it was very forward-looking. Yeah. It was more about what he was going to do differently, how he was going to be different going forward, so rather than just like I'm sorry, I'm yeah, sorry, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm and, sorry, and, until and, you kind of me. forgive me. It's more about the, exactly, exactly establishing a respectful relationship. The phrase "vengeance is a dish." best yeah. served cold has come into my mind, but to feel the temptation of vengeance, yeah. Um, yeah. but to be forward-looking is... Uh, yeah, but but that's the point of that. What you have to consider is where are you actually going to do your best work? And I I didn't yeah. think... So I want to talk, turn a bit to the Citadels of Pride now. Uh, I think, and you have three that you, you draw in, in, in the book, and there's a, a sort of category that you describe, which is... A citadel of pride is is somewhere where there are domains of well protected pride. That's how you describe it, and usually that's an area where a few people of unusual talent make a lot of money or wield a lot of power, and that leads them to have what you call inflamed pride. And these areas where they're sort of they're, economists might prefer think of them as winner takes all type markets or just places where there's dis- very very disproportionately weighted power star power of one kind or another and and so you you have the example of law and clerkships for uh, justices celebrity which obviously we've just talked about in terms of your own personal experience where you've got a star who brings in all the money uh, and then you talk about kind of college sports in in particular I want to dig into the college sports one as an example but have I characterized them properly? Well, you've left out one thing that's really important, which is weak structures. You can have great power, but if there are clear rules and good structures, then that doesn't do so much harm. And I think that's true by and large in the business world. Look, we have CEOs being yes, fired who was, because they who was violated the, the guy who got fired for the having CEO a relation, a consenting relationship at McDonald's. Yeah. McDonald's. Yeah. And I think it's at a law firm, that's how it is. So um, in the world of performing arts, the structures are weak because people move from one gig to the other. There's no stability. 
I know actors in Sweden who have tenure in the National Theater. That it's different there because they're in one institution, their whole career, they have tenure and there are clear rules. So so it's whether the rules are lacking in the performing arts, the unions are usually very weak and they don't demand in the contract uh, adherence to certain rules. But that's changing now, I would say. But in, in the back to the law, it's true only at the higher levels of the judiciary, because the judges don't have very good codes and, and rules of conduct. And that has to some extent been reformed by Chief Justice Roberts, as I mentioned. He convened a commission to reform. But what people were told if they were clerks was that you can't blab. Everything has to be confidential. Now, in general, that's a, a good rule. But of course, it's not a good rule where it comes to whistleblowing about sexual harassment. And that wasn't made clear. And so all these people thought, well, I've seen, of course, some of it was just bullying. It wasn't sexual, but I've seen uh, bullying. I've seen sexual uh, harassment, but I mustn't say anything about my job. And now it's made absolutely explicit that whistleblowing is something separate and that not only may a clerk do it, but you have an obligation to do it. And the, the judges who are in power in the circuit have an obligation to listen to that and pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's enough because I think the de facto power of the one judge over the one clerk is so great for the whole of that person's career. It's as though your one thesis advisor was in power over your academic career the whole yeah, of your life. Yeah, it's just a weird, life, as you say, it's a kind case. of strangely intimate one-on-one yeah. -on -one kind of relationship and it's shrouded in all this yeah. all this mystery. And so, I, yeah. uh, and yeah. you're right, there's been some reforms and more to go. And you also do a, a really nice job of going through various uh, perform, you know, in performing arts conductors and so on, um, and the kind of twos and fro's, including Placido Domingo, who you think was in some ways much less of an offender than others. But the one way I think you know, and I, I'd love to talk about all of those, but let's dig in on college sports because I think this is a, a good one and where you perhaps go furthest um, and where you think you describe the college sports and particularly Division One football and basketball as beyond saving that it will have to be totally dismantled. Um, so you're quite hopeful that the trend in the other citadels is at least in the right direction and some market for combination of market forces and governance will kind of, sort. but this is, this is just completely broken because of the weird nexus of corporate power and academic freedom. And it's just, this, it's a hot mess basically. And I sort of agree with that, but, but how does that hot mess yeah. of college sports, D1 sports play out in terms of this particular issue? I was struck, I think you have on your website figures, most schools have had at least one incident of sexual misconduct. This is yeah. rife. In D one, and why why D why D one, and why does why is there no way to to just reform it? Increasingly, basketball is departing and going its own way. I've uh, had help on this issue with, from Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, and he's in favor of what I'm in favor of: going over to a system of minor leagues that baseball has long since had, where part of the player management contract can be rules about sexual assault and also domestic violence. And that's what the professional leagues have been doing. They need to do better, but they, they've been doing it for a long time. And the NBA has done that. And they have the advantage that basketball is international. The European basketball teams are de facto minor league for the NBA. And so too is this official minor league, the G League. And so since you can play top basketball when you're 18 or 19, they don't need to go to college to get that. They do need an education. And Adam Silver is trying to set up learning academies for the young people in the G League. Yeah. Basketball is on the wrong side. Yeah. But football, see, the trouble with football is there is no international game of American football. So they have no source of training the, the way basketball does. And it's very expensive. The facilities, the equipment, much, much more expensive than basketball, which you can play on any street corner, you know, basically it's the same. Um, so what has happened is that apparel companies have formed investment groups together with alumni groups, and they've invested heavily in the university in funding this expensive enterprise, but they call themselves a part of the university. It's Absolutely. essentially a tax dodge, and there are lots of litigation about that. But in any case, they, they claim they're part of this nonprofit organization and they have a lot of money poured into this. And they have therefore a stake in saying, 
that these people are student athletes. Now, the student athlete has always been an anomaly for a long time. The NCAA has tried to make sure they actually go to class and get an education, but it's a losing game for, for this reason, that there's a small supply of talents at that each year there will be maybe 10 big talents that might make it to the NFL, and they all compete. All 150 D1 teams compete for those few talents. So, of course, there's a race to the bottom. They lower academic expectations. Some people really are borderline literate. They can, mm. you know, you know the movie The Blind Side. Well, yeah. that was a kind of good, good story where he actually did learn to read and write and, and so forth, and he actually had a good NFL career. But often it's it's not that way, and the person gets injured and doesn't have an NFL career, still can't read and write. So they exploit these athletes. They treat, they objectify them. And there's a lot of racism in yes, that objectification. Mm. I, I tried to bring that out mm. with the story of, of Jameis Winston. They're treated as, you know, black bodies who are going to make a lot of money for white corporate investors, basically. And so then uh, they, they don't expect much of them because they objectify them. So they don't care whether they get a real education. So they look the other way when there's academic corruption and cheating. They also look the other way where there's bad sexual conduct. Because again, they treat them as a kind of, you know, objectified mm -hmm. animal body who can make a lot of money for them. And since the whole town, in some cases, in Tallahassee is the case I look at, is invested in the victories of this team, they have uh, the district attorney, the lawyers, everyone is a, an alum and maybe an investor too in, in many cases. So they, there's an, a lot of incentives not to fix the problem. I don't see any way to fix it, except unless the athlete, you know, this is what's happening now, as I say at the end of the chapter, the court has agreed to hear this case as an antitrust case. And I think they're going to say that they have to be paid. These paid entertainers will perform on the campus and they're going to be called students, but also paid entertainers. You just can't combine those two roles. Mm. You can't, if they're paid what they're actually what their talent deserves, like a minor league football player, they would be paid so much that it, it doesn't make any sense for them to go to class and so forth. So I think that situation is mm -hmm. unstable and it's bound to fall apart one way or the other, but it will be quite interesting to see how it falls apart. What should happen in my view is that they see, okay, they're going to be paid. We'll call it a minor league. We'll set it up with decent facilities and so on. But you know, right now, the best football facilities and, and, and not uh, accepting the NFL. One of the astonishing facts in your book is that um, there are 10 college stadiums, I think, that are bigger than the next biggest NFL uh, stadium. And so the amount, you're right, the amount, amount of money in it. So if, you, if we kind of rip the veil off the idea of the student athlete, then you'll get some accountability mechanisms, which might be more about, you know, like it's fine to be a profit seeking organization so long as you're then subject to market pressures and consumer pressures which force good behavior but but it's where you have the corporate pressure but then the academic shield and so it's very sort of a situation where basically you can't get the kind of accountability mechanisms which you've seen really developing elsewhere it's a real holdout against the growth in accountability what's happened in the professional leagues is that when the players and management negotiate for contract the players want these mechanisms of accountability and they demand it and they put it in. Baseball has gone the furthest. So we have one case now, the best pitcher on the New York Yankees was out for about 18 months for domestic violence. He's come back, but he's not quite up to his usual standard and, and so forth. But um, the football has not done quite as well. There's still gaps, but people are still quite a few are held accountable. We yeah. have recent cases like Deshaun Watson, and real attention being paid. And basketball has been quite good. I want to turn lastly, in terms of substance uh, in the book, anyways, your chapter on Title IX uh, and what's happened. You know, so we're staying on colleges and college campuses. Obviously, it's a very hot topic. Um, yeah. I think you make the point that colleges are somewhat different uh, although attending college doesn't doesn't seem to increase the risk of assault, there's something different about colleges, um, and I, I'm not. I, I think I'm just going to accept that for now. I've often wondered why 
No, well, actually, no, let's not. Actually, let me change my mind. You say, and challenge that a little bit, you say colleges are different because they have different rules and the criminal justice system takes a long time and that the impact on the wrongdoer um, could be significant. So there's a deterrence to reporting. But I still, I still guess I wonder whether if you're a working class woman working in a church or, or something, whether it's so very different to predominantly upper middle class women on colleges. Like they need special rules? Well, I guess I think, look, any workplace needs clear rules and it needs some way of, of adjudicating. And when we're dealing with, though, with, let's say, the faculty at my university, it's very like a law firm. There's not any big difference. I think the, the adjudication could be very similar. But the young people, there are several things. First of all, they're there for a per- fixed period of time which is rather short in workplace terms. And then they have a very important interest at stake. That is education. Even courts have said it's a major property interest because, of course, your subsequent career depends on your degree by and large. The third thing that's unusual is that they live Mm -hmm. there. A lot of them, most in the United States, live on campus and therefore, there's a lot of partying and drinking. That's true. This it blurs true the, the line the between. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And 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 because of the 21 drinking age, this partying is unsupervised. It has to be unsupervised because if I or any other adult goes to a party where underage drinking is going on, which is everywhere on the campus, I'm committing a crime of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Mm. So the there's you can't supervise the party. This is why every college administrator I well, know you, wants and you, the and age you lower you propose that, and obviously so coming from a European is, background and having kids yeah, gone to yeah, both colleges on both sides yeah, of the Atlantic, yeah. I could not agree with you more because there is a huge difference between going for a drink yeah. at the college bar and being served by adults and, you know, and, and having to go to a fraternity house to do it and therefore not right. be so – the lack of supervision around it. So I, you know, I was very pleased to see you say that. I, I also slightly wondered, I've thought that we should just get rid of fraternities altogether. They seem to be a big source of the problem. But I wonder if that, if you took away the alcohol incentive, right? If you, if, if you're a young woman on campus and the choice, the choice is yeah. no longer okay. either don't drink or go to a fraternity to drink. And instead you can just go to a, a normal bar, then probably most women would vote with their feet, right? Oh, right. And the thing is, there are different types of fraternities. You, The ones you hear about are the ones that are there largely for drinking and partying, but there are lots of different kinds of fraternities and sororities. And so I'm not going to say that none of them serve a good purpose. There are some that are more academic, some more performing arts oriented and so forth. So I think the best course with the fraternity, you can't tell them they can't exist. They're a private organization. You can tell them that they can't get subsidy from the university and in effect kick them off Mm. campus. And that often happens if they have a sufficiently bad record of bad behavior. And and I think that's probably the best remedy. But yeah, I mean, it's only if you first fix the alcohol problem because there's no other situation in the workplace where there's persistent, I mean, 90% of our sexual assault complaints at the University of Chicago on the student side have to do with both parties being very, very drunk. So it's very hard for there to be accountability because there's memory gaps and so on. And you know, the most you can say is, well, you can never have intercourse with somebody who's sufficiently impaired, and then we have to define what that is and so on. But the people I know who've been on these tribunals say it's very difficult because there's no evidence. The evidence is cor- corrupted by memory gaps and by both people drinking all the time. So it impedes the culture of accountability. And it's just a very bad culture, period. So if you could, as you suggest, just go go to a bar or have the same yes. party, but supervised by adults. It's, that's a very yes, different it's thing. It, they're doing, they're doing something illegal prevent- and they're not allowed to do. And so if then something, something bad happens while they're yeah. doing that, the incentives to report it, to to be supervising it, and so on. You've almost you've sort of got a bad thing happening within what would be seen as a bad thing, and so all the all the incentives are, are wrong, right? Basically, around that. Yeah, and of course, the police are never going to actually police underage drinking. That's the hypocrisy of it. That there are, there are these laws 
But we know that privileged college students are, I mean, the same was true for marijuana before it was legalized, that, yeah, you, um, you, you couldn't, you could smoke, uh, smoke pot on campus and no one would ever arrest you. So there's great hypocrisy in the system. There's no point in having it be illegal because it's not enforced. So the whole thing, the whole system is bad. Just talk just a little bit more about Title IX, yeah. if you could be... Okay, so the first question is, should we have these campus tribunals? And I offer some reasons to think we don't have to rely on the criminal justice system. There are lots of reasons internal to the campus where for a range of things, including plagiarism and all kinds of offenses, a campus tribunal is the way to go because it can give a remedy that's not as fatal to the person's whole life. And, you know, that's pretty important if it's a first offender and and so forth. But it can also give the victim a way of getting on with her academic life. And that's very important to try to arrange it so that you're not in the same class as the person who assaulted you. And so so there's a good reason for the campuses to handle these things. But then the question comes up, what should they be like? Should they involve lawyers? What should the burden of proof be? So the, the storm, the recent storm started when President Obama's Department of Education sent a bunch of universities this, what was called the Dear Colleague Letter, that said that henceforth the tribunals should use the preponderance of evidence standard. So basically there are three burdens of proof in American law. Beyond a reasonable doubt, the standard criminal law system, the um, preponderance of the evidence, which means basically 51% versus 49%. more likely, just slightly more likely than not. And then there's a middle one called clear and convincing evidence that's sometimes used in family law, which is more like 75% or something like that. So so what the Obama department was saying is now you're going to use the weakest one. So if it's just marginally more likely than not, the person gets convicted. There were lots of objections to that. So a group of law professors, mostly left-wing law professors, actually, at Harvard Law School, objected because there there had been a a case uh, at Harvard where there was an African-American defendant who seemed to actually to have been wrongly convicted. I think it's a very unclear case because, again, the evidence is very weird and tainted. But in any case, here's this guy, working class black man, who was convicted on the basis of a almost a hunch, because you just have to say, is this slightly more likely than not? And they objected to that. And they, at first, they said, we want reasonable doubt. And they asked for a lot of other things. Reasonable doubt, you almost never get in a right. situation where both parties are drinking. That's just such a stringent standard. And furthermore, there were other things that are even more important than that, namely the right to confront the witnesses against you. And they they did ask for that. And eventually, that's that's what they they got at Harvard. I think that's very important. But anyway, um, that voice of complaint set off a political debate. And when Betsy DeVos came in as Trump's Secretary of Education, she proposed dropping uh, the, the, sta- the preponderance of the evidence standard and going over to a much more stringent standard. And she proposed sure. a number of other things. I won't go through them because. But one of them was the definition the definition of harassment helpful. stuff as well. But, um, but you you do explicate all this. Yeah. But this this burden of proof one, I think, yeah, is a good. Have, it stands yeah. in for a lot of the other debates that are, that were going on throughout. The- and you have to say it's harassment, and not a, you have to distinguish between harassment and assault. If there's a physical assault, then one act is enough. But if it's harassment, the st- legal standard is it has to be pervasive. And serious, one rude remark is not enough to convict you of sexual harassment. So the, the policies that she proposed made a kind of hash of, of that distinction. And it had to be fixed up through the notice and comment process, which the um, administrative agencies always have to have. And now the policies that, that's come out from that is, I think, much better because it does protect the accused. It says you can the campuses can choose between clear and convincing evidence and preponderance of the evidence. Although I think everyone understands that would mean a kind of preponderance plus, not just the 51% kind, but something in the middle, and that there should be the right to confront witnesses against you. And that if it's not an assault, but just sexist remarks, then you need a pattern. 
you don't get convicted on the basis of one thing. So all that is much better. But we still have a further problem, which I talk about, which is that people are scared and they don't have lawyers advising them. You're usually allowed to bring one person to the hearing, but you're deterred from having a lawyer come to the hearing. I think this is really wrong. It's a way of trying to expedite the process because lawyers always hold things up. But it's not fair to the accused. You should not only have the right to have a lawyer, you should have free assistance of a lawyer. Columbia has done this. We're going over to that system too. And the other universities are following suit. This is important because it's all your whole life is at stake. Your college career being dismissed from a university because of sexual assault charges. That's not, that's that not a trivial, really a trivial thing. Life. And you've added the idea of uh, a free legal counsel. But it was interesting to me that so the Obama Dear Colleague letter had all the problems that you've identified, uh, an overly uh, generous definition in terms of harassment and the preponderance. And the final rule that DeVos came up with after all the comment period was basically pretty good. I mean, you say it's superior certainly to the initial rule from her and the, and it's superior to the Obama rules, which actually gave me a little bit of faith in the whole idea of comment periods in government. I mean, the, the difference between the two and DeVos, she may not have started in the right place, but she got, she ended up, I was going to say dragged to, but she ended up in pretty much the right place with the final rule, right? So what would you say now to the Biden yeah. people who are looking at the DeVos final rule? What is there there that you think, if anything, needs improving? Or is the main message, look, it actually is pretty good. You should probably stick mostly with where she landed. I, the first thing is I don't want to use she all the time because I don't think she had all that much to do with it. She was much more concerned with schools than with universities. Sure. And she was uh, paying attention to other right. things. It was the, the department and it was the process, yeah. the notice and comment yeah. process, which administrative agencies always use. And I think it does show that the process worked pretty well. So, you know, we have to keep looking at it and we have to ask things like does for a while, the Title IX offices were playing both investigative jobs and assessing jobs. And that was un unbundled. So that's one wrong thing that was eliminated. But I think we do need to look at representation. Sure. I think that it would be very good if they could just add to that a requirement that you have free assistance of legal counsel. Now, of course, somebody's got to pay for this. And so universities that are not so wealthy, uh, I don't know. I mean, Biden is trying to get Congress to appropriate money for so many things. I don't think that he's inclined to add to the omnibus infrastructure bill or whatever bill it would be a further requirement that money would be appropriated to pay for lawyers for people accused of sexual assault. So somebody's got to pay for it. Uh, could be that universities themselves will all decide to go in that direction. There is this proposal that is in the other chapter that, that my colleague Sol Levmore and I made that universities would contract with a kind of a law firm or some other insurer for a kind of insurance mm. policy that everyone, every undergraduate would have to carry sexual assault insurance. And then if you were too problematic in, let's say, a fraternity or a, a group of people had been charged more often, they lose their insurance. And so so something, a, a scheme like that might be something to be tried. But I, I don't think Biden should get meddle in that. I, I just think it's something that universities I thought it was a fascinating idea, uh, the idea of kind of insur insuring against some of these risks would do it. And um, it would be interesting to see how this plays out. But so yeah. I think we're coming to the end of our time, Martha. You've been very, very generous with your time. I know you have kind of lots to do. If you're willing to just share a couple of sentences on what you're working on now, I know you have a book coming on animal rights, which is something your daughter worked on, if I remember correctly, yeah. and extending the capability yeah. I, I watched a little bit of your lecture on that. Um, if you're willing to just share a, a, a bit of a, te a teaser, if you like, on that, because it sounds fascinating that yeah. you're going to extend capability theory to animals. Yeah. And you'll see hmm. soon the Holberg lecture that I'm giving together with the Holberg Prize. It's already been filmed, but it won't hmm. be out until hmm. June, I don't know, 10th or something. But that also is another snippet from the book. Um, yeah, my, my daughter, who died in December 2019, very tragically, she was a lawyer with the organization called Friends of Animals and worked on the rights, not of domestic animals, but rather of wild animals. And she was particularly interested in marine mammals. So I mm. wrote several articles with her about the rights of whales and 
happens under international law. Anyway, the book is really about all kinds of animals, and it's a new account of what the best theoretical basis for animal rights is going forward. And so I have some chapters dealing with other approaches, utilitarian approaches, Kantian approaches, and yes. what I call the so like us approach, the Scala Naturae approach. Uh, and then I give reasons why those are not such great approaches and then recommend a version of my capabilities approach. But then I have to say at great length how you adapt this to the many different species of animals. How would you possibly get a capabilities list and how would you realize it in practice? So then I have a bunch of chapters saying, how do you do this for companion animals? And there, by the way, I use the, the, the idea of mandatory reporting. I think we should have a a kind of ministry of animal welfare in each city and jurisdiction that's rather like the ministry of child welfare. And there should be people who are mandatory hmm. reporters for animal abuse, because again, we have laws, but they're never Bastard. enforced. So of course, the first thing is animal, animals have to have legal standing, but the real problem, you know, is, is the wild animals because they cross jurisdictions and the whales are, you know, there, some of them, the ones who are in coastal waters of one country, can be protected. And indeed, the Marine Mammal Protection Act does a pretty good job of protecting those. But these international conventions, treaties, have proven hopelessly weak because if some country doesn't like it, like Japan just quit the International Whaling Commission because they were tired of arguing in favor of commercial whaling and they just decided, okay, we're going to resume commercial whaling and we're not care about you. So we really have to work on that. And I think the way, the only way to deal with the international sphere is to build the consciousness of humanity. It's sort of like human rights, really, that it's, it's notional right now, but we have to try to show going forward what full justice would look like, what a virtual constitution for these creatures would be. And then let's hope that in time, we'll be able to enforce this legally in a much mm. more robust way than we are now. But of course, this involves things like protecting animal habitats, cleaning up the plastic trash in the ocean. So it's a vast job. Whales die because they eat plastic, because it makes them feel full, and then they starve to death. So this is a, a, a tremendous job, and it's not perhaps as malign as some forms of animal abuse, but it is negligence. Air pollution is another thing that kills lots of animals, but in that case, the birds are lucky because <laughs> humans get killed by air pollution so, too. So the Clean Air Act is actually up the migrant, the population of migratory birds in the United States. This is fascinating. I look forward to And congratulations on the Holberg yeah. Prize, by the way, one of your many prizes. And obviously we'll link to that, uh, that oh, lecture and much. this idea of an ethical revolution in some ways, similar to some of the human rights movements we've seen before about moving, you, I think you talk about moving from the idea of an object to a subject, and that being the critical ethical transition, and now wanting to apply that to animals too. And then what that means in terms of an unwritten constitution and international law and adjusting capability theory to that is obviously the next challenge. But I agree with you that the first thing is just ethically to get our head around the fact that animals are have some entitlement to a flourishing life. That they have a point of view on the world, that they are genuinely sentient. I mean, even scientists didn't realize that until about the last 20 years. But now scientists do recognize that an animal has a point of view on the world, has things that it values, it strives for. And so back to my own doctoral dissertation, we can have a common explanation, as Aristotle put it, of animal movement, that all animals are, are striving to get the things that they care about through the movement mm. that they can execute. Well, it sounds, sounds so, terrific. Anyway, and we, we managed to go so a long way without exactly. mentioning Aristotle, but of course, in the end, Martha, he lies He lies beneath everything, at least for, for, for you. So, and it sounds like that'll be a wonderful tribute to your daughter as well. Congratulations yeah. on the prize, the new book and all your work. And thanks again for coming on. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. It's really been a great pleasure to be on this. And thanks for the, the wonderful questions. Thanks for listening to Dialogues. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And if you did, please take a moment to follow, like, rate, and share the podcast in all the usual places. And send me your thoughts and ideas, including for future guests, to 
to dialoguespod at gmail.com. That's dialoguespod at gmail.com. I'll see you next time.